Welcome to Biology 221. This semester, we're going to be discovering the topics associated with the, the study of microbiology, which is the study of microbes. Each of our chapters will be broken down into topics, and each of those topics will have an accompanying video lecture. These video lectures are meant to augment your textbook reading and to help further explain some concepts that may be tr troubling you. I do not expect these video lectures to replace your textbook at all. I expect you to use these to help you work through the Learn Smart slash Smart Book activities that you can find in Blackboard. Sometimes I'll use other sources for your video lecture instead of me because it provides a little bit of spice to life, mixes things up, and usually the videos are much better than I could possibly do in my own or my own office as you can see here. So now let's get started with our first topic, overview. Microbes are all around. Every topic will have a little slide that just reminds us of why this topic is important. It's really easy sometimes when we're getting so engrossed in very specific details about things to forget why it's important to learn this material. So for this material, it's just basically to set the, ter the tone for the entire semester. What are we going to talk about? What are our themes for the semester? Each lecture will also have a set of objectives, and you can also find these in a Word document within Blackboard. These are going to be the objectives that I expect you to have mastered by the end of each topic. For instance, you can see that we have five topics for today. And so if you have any questions about these, please let me know, because these are what our test questions are going to come off of, what our in-class activities are going to work off of, and anything else I expect you to do will be based on these objectives. So let's get started. As I said, microbiology is, of course, the study of microbes. And in order to study these, we have to know what a microbe is. Basically, anything that can't be seen without magnification is a microbe. Now, some of the worms, the helminths we're going to talk about, can be seen without a microscope when they get really big. But they also exist in cells that are not visible to the naked eye. So that's why they are counted in this group. So we have three main types of microbes that are divided into five groups. Our prokaryotes are our cells that lack a nucleus, and these are the bacteria. This is E. coli, Salmonella, Clostridium, Bacillus, basically all the stuff we're going to work with throughout the semester in lab. That's the bacteria group. We then have three groups of eukaryotes, which are defined by having a nucleus within their cells and can be multicellular organisms. This is the fungi, the protozoa, and the helminths. And then last, we have the viruses, which are non-living or partially living infectious particles that we're going to talk about in Chapter 5. Now, don't worry. I don't expect you to know about all these yet or have them totally memorized. Just be familiar with them because each of these will have... Each of these will have their own topics within our unit, and they will we'll talk about them a lot more. So if you have any questions as these come up, please let me know. And maybe you'll even discover your favorite microbe. My personal favorite is viruses. So I've already used the two most basic terms I expect you to master this semester. If you learn nothing else, I hope that you understand the difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotic cells are very small, much older, evolutionarily speaking, and have no nucleus or traditional organelles that we think of, such as mitochondria, chloroplasts, endoplasm, reticulums, etc. They have been around on the Earth almost 2 billion years before the first eukaryotic fossils have been found. So they're much, much older. And in fact, we believe that all prokaryotes came from one original progenitor cell. We then believe that some of these prokaryotes evolved into the eukaryotes, which are or cells that have a membrane-bound nucleus as well as membrane-bound organelles. These are the cells that you and I are made up of, as well as trees, plants, dogs, and helminths, fungi, and protozoa. One more thing to talk about on this is the theory of evolution. What do I mean by theory of evolution is that this is where we started, where we believe all life on this planet originated from. We believe that all cells arose from one cell, and only through variation over time with different environmental stimuli did we arrive at the diversity we see today. Now, a lot of people get confused what a theory is. They think, oh, it's a hunch, it's a hypothesis, it's something we're not sure about. In science, a theory is a well-proven principle. It's something we have studied again and again, and we have lots and lots of facts and data that add up to producing this theory, such as the theory of relativity or the theory of gravity, things like that. We don't expect them to change. We do expect that as we get new data that it would come in and potentially augment the picture a little bit. We don't expect the underlying principles of these theories to change. 
So let's talk about how these microbes shaped our planet. Remember how I said that prokaryotes had the Earth to themselves for almost 2 billion years? Well, they were doing a lot of work during that time. For instance, one of the largest contributions that they made was adding oxygen to our Earth's atmosphere. Could you imagine what life would be like if we didn't have that? We wouldn't, life as we know it wouldn't exist. The oxygen that you and I depend on wouldn't be available. We also know that they have the bacteria and other microbes help shape our soil composition, mineral usage, and ozone gases. So these are all huge impacts. So remember, every time we think about microbes, we're not talking only just about bacteria. Pathogen, pathogenic ones or ones that are causing disease. We're talking about the ones that make it so your corn is as sweet as, as it is or that the trees can be, bloom when they do. That's, they're all really important for our environment. So microbes are not all bad. So now let's wrap up this topic with one more thing I want to overview. This is how humans and microbes interact. We have three main things I want to talk about biotechnology, pathogenic microbes, and symbiotic microbes. Biotechnology is where we harness uh, microbes to help do or help produce things for us. Pathogenic microbes uh, are the microbes that cause disease in humans, such as um, foodborne illnesses or bloodborne pathogens. And then we have the symbiotic microbes, which help um, our bodies function the way we do, as well as in other microbiomes as well, but I'm going to talk about it in terms of us. So first, let's look at biotechnology. Now, I know this slide's got a lot of text on it, and you'll see this sometimes throughout the, um, the PowerPoints, is that they'll have a lot of text. I want you to be able to use these as an outline, so don't worry about reading them as we go through. Just try to listen and grab the big concepts as we go. Underline things or add to them as you go. So there are three main things that we do in biotechnology, genetic engineering, recombinant DNA technology, and bioremediation. Genetic engineering and recombinant DNA technology are really similar and they're easy to get confused. Remember, recombinant DNA technology is always genetic engineering, but genetic engineering is not always recombinant DNA technology. For example, we can go in and modify the genome of an organism. This creates a genetically modified organism. But if we insert the genes from another organism, that becomes recombinant DNA technology. One of the most classic examples in microbiology is that we have been able to insert the gene for human insulin into E. coli and have E. coli produce insulin for human use. So that's where all of our diabetics get their insulin from. Bioremediation is when we can use microbes, either naturally occurring or introducing them, to help clean up toxic pollutants. I don't know if you read any stories, but they believe that the Gulf Coast is actually recovering from the oil spill a lot faster, and that's due to actually some oil-eating bacteria that they found in the, in the Gulf Coast. So as you can see, it's helping us clean up this oil spill. Well, it's, it's helping clean up the oil spill a lot faster. And if we were able to identify this bacteria and work with it to grow it and maintain it, if we ever have a situation like this occur again, it could really become useful for us. So now let's talk about microbes harming humans. This is why you're all here. All of you guys, future health professionals of America, need to understand the role that microbes play in human health. And as you can see here, within the United States, two of the leading causes of death are microbe related and then worldwide four are so it's really important that as healthcare professionals you understand what the risks are how do we prevent infection how do we treat infections how do we diagnose infections and we're going to spend an entire unit focusing on this material Lastly, I want to talk about the microbiome. This is becoming a very hot topic in research. Researchers are just now beginning to understand how critical it is that our microbiome, which is the totality of the organisms within an area, that means all the variety of organisms and the quantity of each of these variety of organisms, are very important, such as the microbiome of the human gut. They're starting to believe that People with autoimmune diseases may have been infected, may have had their gut microbiome affected as children by antibiotics, and having that altered, that's what started producing the autoimmune diseases that we've seen. We've started seeing that people will do such things as fecal transplants, which will allow us to change out the gut bacteria of one person for the healthy microbiome of another person. Um, and seeing that it actually helps cure diseases. So where do you get your microbiome from? 
It comes from the vaginal canal or through breastfeeding when you're born. So basically, you can thank your mother for it. But the environment and other impact, other things can also impact your microbiome. And so that's why we're seeing a lot of discussion lately about the overuse of antibiotics, especially for things such as urinary tract infections or sinus infections. And that's because we can tell that they're altering our microbiomes and potentially irreversibly changing that, and that could lead to a lot of long-term health effects. We're going to talk about the microbiome a lot this semester, so if you have any questions about it, please let me know. And I've also included some additional information in Blackboard. This is the end of our lecture. Please review these objectives and let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.